Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Arnie Lukes here at the Crossroads, and I'd like to welcome my guests from Canada. Welcome, Robert Clank. Hello, Arnie. Good to be with you again. No worries. Pleased to have you back and uh, and see that you're fighting fit. That's fantastic, Robert. Good news. And Wallace Clank. Welcome, Wallace. Right. Nice to see you again, Arnie, and to be with you on this this topic that we're pursuing. Our weather here in Canada right now, in the West at least, is fairly wet and damp. Mm. Reminds me a little bit of the, the one and only time I was in Melbourne. <laughs> okay. Yep, yep, yep. No worries. Well, um, okay, in Adelaide, the weather, we're in midwinter, obviously, and the weather is um, is quite pleasant. It's fresh, okay, it gets down to maybe five or seven or something in the mornings um, overnight. But we're up to mid-teens, 17 on a good day, and it's calm. The um, it's, it's pleasant for winter. And it's beautiful to see the almond blossom is out and uh, other trees, other fruit trees, the um, bud burst is close. And, and to me, that's, a, if you like, a, a continuation of the cycle of life, that um, the world is always being, if you like, our environment. We're watching it and we're always seeing it as being creative. And um, it is creating new flowers, new life, new fruit, and uh, the seasons come and the seasons go. And so uh, it's uh, a reflection to me of the natural world, the natural order. Our title, Creative Destruction, it has its roots in Marxism. And um, what we're seeing at the moment is we're seeing the destruction, if you like, the final stages of destruction of the West, the Christian West. Um, where its roots, its Christian roots, are essentially from Europe, and they, um, if you like, they evangelized out into the world. But we're seeing that those roots are being uh, torn asunder, and t uh, today we're witnessing the actual deliberate destruction of the West's economy, and transferring that, the final stages of transferring that across to, if you like, supposedly third world countries, but in actual fact, nuclear powers such as China and India. Now, over the weekend, late last week, there was a, a newspaper article um, that I've come, for, I've come across from several sources, but this one is Reuters, and it deals with uh, demonstrators storm the Serbian parliament protesting about the lockdown, and... A later article that I did receive from Israel Shamir was in regard to the fact that these um, these Serbians have pushed back against the lockdown. They've pushed back against the tyranny. They've pushed back at the um, deconstruction of their culture, of their life, of their historical and ancient freedoms. Now, creative destruction, as I understand it, is a Marxist concept, and we do need to explore this and understand it, because to me, this is the outworking of their philosophy. I wonder if you could help us in this uh, defining moment, Robert Clink. Well, creative destruction is actually, uh, it has its own article in Wikipedia, I discovered today. Mm -hmm. And they identified Marx as being one of the earlier formulators of that phrase. It has a German uh, uh, equivalent, which is Vernichtung. <laughs> now, uh, I was quite surprised some months ago when I heard that it was being uh, circulated in conservative party circles in the UK. And I, I should have been aware of it because it's been... Uh, very prominent in Marxist theory for a long time now. Uh, it's basically the idea that in order to progress, you must destroy. So, uh, in, and indeed, in order to progress significantly, you must destroy a lot. So what we're seeing now is an attempt to bring the whole structure of society down and the thinking, I presume, of the people who are working at this is that it's going to lead to some great uh, uh, achievements and progress for society. Looking at the people who are promoting the idea, I can hardly imagine that they're going to contribute very much to that because they don't seem to have anything but rioting in the streets in mind. But it's, uh, 
uh, a total devaluation of all the achievements of the past. You know, all the, the glories of our culture, which we used to uh, take pride in. The art and the architecture, the philosophy, uh, mathematics, uh, technological achievements, you know, amazing things that are created in the in medieval times that you can barely comprehend today, these fantastic clocks that were models of the whole solar system and things like that. They were fantastic. And there's no way that the people who are trying to tear everything down are going to generate anything equivalent to that in the future. Included in the glories of our culture are the institutions, such as, uh, you know, trial by jury. What a wonderful in innovation. It put the ultimate decision over your dispensation out of a uh, legal situation in the hands of your fellow citizens. And uh, could anything be safer for an individual who has been uh, put in a position of having to defend himself? If you have 12 average people from your community examining your case, it seems to me that that's about the safest place to uh, put your, uh, your future. Even institutions like marriage, you know, marriage has been under assault now for decades. And uh, the attempt has been made to devalue it. Look at all the uh, uh, entertainment products that come out, all the movies, marriage, divorce, they're, you know, they're just insignificant. There's nothing sacred or uh, fundamental about them. If uh, you're not getting along, well, you just toss it in and move on to some other person. But that is not at all the concept of marriage that developed in Christian society. And uh, indeed, in pretty well every other society, marriage is taken more seriously than it's uh, developed to be regarded in, in the society we're in. So the idea is that everything has to be swept into the dustbin of history in order for man to progress. So the destruction is a good thing because it allows progress. But this implies a kind of worship of progress. And it's an arbitrary concept of progress because I think everybody wants nothing but progress. People normally want stability in their lives and they want the good things they have achieved to be preserved, but these uh, uh, dialectics uh, uh, practitioners want to tear all that down and discard it. Mm. Uh, it, it. It was an idea that was formulated by Leon Trotsky, although apparently he borrowed it from a banker named Helfand who operated under the revolutionary name of Parvis. These were very, very brilliant people and they, uh, uh, threw great uh, spanners into the works of civilization because of their cleverness. But Trotsky came up with the idea of uh, perpetual revolution. And perpetual revolution is just another word for creative destruction because the revolution has to change everything constantly. There's no, no stability, there's no permanence about anything. So this is a thinking that has been inculcated in generations of students, particularly university students, uh, for decades now. And we're uh, reaping the destructive effects of the brainwashing of all those students. I was in university in the 1960s. I was studying history and in the mathematics department, there weren't so many Marxists, I don't think so. Although I think, I think there were a few but in the history department, I think it was probably 80% who were Marxists. And one of them was actually a, a fellow from Romania who uh, somebody I met told me had been involved in ordering the executions of people. So how in the world somebody like that gets into a university institution in Alberta is a little bit strange. So what we've seen is a sabotage of our culture through the university educational system now for many, many decades, and it's not unprecedented. Remember that uh, Adam Weishaupt was 
a university professor at the University of Ingolstadt, and he was working with the staff there. So they were spreading these revolutionary ideas of uh, destruction that we might progress to a, a new and uh, better world all the way back to that period. I'm sure it extends back even further because it's something that is constantly coming back and being uh, activated in, in, in society and all this awful rioting and so on we've seen lately and all the terrible assaults on our children with their perverted uh, ideas about uh, sex education, you know, it's all of a piece. It all holds together and it's all designed to destroy what has gone in the past so that a new world can be created. And people who have enjoyed the fruits of the, the old world are not going to like what's coming. Yeah, no, thank you for that, Robert. That's, um, that's, that analysis is actually quite intimidating because it means that the, um, each part of our institutions is under threat, each part of our history is under threat. They want to burn our books, they want to pull our statues down, they want to do away with all the achievements of the past and somehow or other in this destruction they're going to build some sort of utopia. And of course, if you start looking at Mao's China and the um, the creative destruction against those people that happened there, or the Soviet Russia, or Pol Pot, already are men anywhere where there's an imbalance of power and you have a totalitarian, there's a potential that they take upon themselves in a position of power is to arbitrarily decide the value of someone else's life, not their own, of course, but someone else's when power is uh, is seized or it's out of balance so the so in that destruction we're actually not looking at the lessons we're not looking at the lessons of history we may look at something like king john and recognize that this bloke needed to be pulled into line or henry the eighth this bloke these tyrants or or hitler or stalin or whoever these people needed to be pulled into line and so we put in place institutions to pull them into line, to hold them to account and, uh, and this creative destruction is saying, well, no, we don't want that. We actually want to hand back power to some sort of elite totalitarian, if you like, modern technocracy. Um, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing the technocrats. We're mm-hmm. seeing the, the doctors, the scientists determine that um, the world is not a, in a stable environment. The climate is going haywire, which it is not. The medical situation is going haywire, which it is not. So these technocrats are arbitrarily making these decisions and you have to accept them as some sort of gospel when in actual fact they're not. They're just fallible man. Your thoughts, please, uh, Wallace Clank. Well, that's the problem. You see, Marxism is materialist. It is atheistic. It does not believe in God. It doesn't even seem to, it doesn't, it's not even willing to bow to natural law. It is the power of the intellect to create the world in a manner that has been um, conceptualized. And so there is no, the important thing here is that there is no recognized external constraint upon the individual. And it boils down to a, well, it's simply a battle um, based on the idea that might is right. In fact, I'm not even sure if might comes, or right comes into it. Might is exercised in order to achieve a preconceived outcome. So in other words, it is almost, I think, fair to say that it has no moral basis. It seems to be based on, very centrally on the idea of equality. And that is supposed to contain some kind of justice. And so you have here a battle that is going on to create equality. Now, equality is not really something that is representative of nature. Nature actually represents great differentiation. So you can see, and these people, they're not willing to allow 
an alternate view, which is a pretty good exposure of the lack of sincerity, the lack of honesty that is associated with their ideas. They just want to beat opposition down and beat it down by more or less whatever tactic they have at hand to use without any, any morals. Morals are just foolish human moral ideas. If you're going to bow to morals, you'll never get anywhere. You have to use force. And so that's what we're faced with, like it or not. I would have hoped that after the past century, with our uh, experience with the dictators, that maybe we might have learned something. And I'm sure many people have, but it's quite obvious that there are many people in academia and elsewhere who have not learned it or don't want to learn it, and they have ambitions, and they, um, they simply do not bend to truth. They accuse everybody that is not in their camp of being, you know, purveyors of hatred. But you'll find that their doctrine originates from concepts in which hatred was very central and destruction. And now, of course, we are having this resurgence, this bird that has reemerged from the ashes. And um, it's threatening the order of society, the achievements of society. So um, it makes you wonder, actually, nature has its way of functioning. Human beings function but we function in a way that allows us consciously to change our environment, to modify our world. And that, if you think of it, is a very powerful thing. But if it's, if it's conducted with the wrong motivations towards the wrong objectives, it is an extremely dangerous thing. So it has the potential of good and bad and for extremes in both directions. And the people who are rejecting the idea of any external authority obviously are driven by pride because they feel or would represent themselves as being qualified to make world changes that they, al they alone claim the competence to, uh, to oversee. Now, if these people are on the wrong track, we're in for tremendous trouble. And, um, and that's what we're faced with today. There's this culture, destroy the culture idea. Now, the culture is a buildup of achievements, some bad things, but the overcoming of those things to build up a civilization. And those achievements do not have to be destroyed in order for us to continue to advance. It is a, it's a deceit, it's a lie to suggest that everything you have must be, must be sacrificed because it's all inherently evil. So, uh, you know, it's, and of course it's a lie that <laughs> results in destruction. Yeah because the idea of the, the existing order of thing is, things is entirely evil and it des deserves to be destroyed, which is a moral sort of position. Rather strange that they would be taking a moral position being people who don't really believe in such nonsense as mor morals. Mm. Yeah. So it shows that uh, uh, a lack of consistency in their own thinking, in their own professed adherence to reason. They're not reasonable, but they would like to present themselves to their world, their victim, as though they were the epitome of reason. They're not. They're full of inconsistencies 
and not that only inconsistencies, but inconsistencies which lead to policies which are highly damaging to other people. So I'm not just sure if I should go on at this stage. It's, it's, a, it's an intriguing subject. It's almost as though the world operating under natural law operates as it does and seems to be, seems to function in a normal, normal, what the word means, in a pro proper manner until human beings get involved. And we evoke changes, which can be good, but which can also be bad, mm -hmm. which can be well-intended, ill-intended, which can be well-instructed and ill-instructed. And we seem to have been given a unique ability in this respect. We possess intelligence, the power to reason, and we seem to be given the power to use it for good or evil. Yeah, yeah. Thank it's almost that. as though if things had been left alone and things had been left natural, that the natural world would have carried on in its way. But we've we've learned or been led to make a tremendous success and a tremendous mess of it. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's an interesting phenomena you're describing there, Wallace. Because I think of the, um, I think of say. There's a couple of things. Robert mentioned trial by jury. Now there was a uh, historically there was a thing called trial by combat, and um, and I also believe that people were assessed based on dunking them in the river. Um, if they survived, then they were obviously they were not guilty. And it's just this sort of, if you like, hallucinogenic perspective. It's an abstraction that by violence you you're right. You, the bigger knight, the stronger knight, the whatever, the better fighter makes something right. Now this is, I watch, um, I watch, I'm, I'm guilty of it. I watch martial arts movies, and obviously they're orientated towards China, and it shows me within their culture. Um, one is that it's one of feudalism and lords, and the other is that violence seems to be a response to almost um, anything, either revenge or whatever, and. And I think, okay, what is the Christian response to a, a predicament, a, a difficult predicament? What is it? Well, it should be um, pursuing of justice, if you like, or pursuing of law and placing it before um, a court to assess the right and wrong of it. These are our customs. These are our. So there is clearly a distinction that there's an evolution of thinking that's going on there. Of where China was, I think, uh, I think it's, it's been described correctly as the Middle Kingdom, who sort of accepted their lot um, perhaps maybe 500 or 700 years ago. This is where we are when we really haven't moved on from there. Um, within their culture, whether that's good or bad, that's neither here nor there. The thing is that that's where they are. Whereas we have moved on, and uh, we have moved on by these, if you like, these cultural developments of innocent till proven guilty which, of course, um, the French is different. It's guilty until proven innocent. So that in itself is based on the, the if you like, the Christian concept that when Jesus stood before the Sanhedrin, um, their false witnesses were not able to substantiate it, but there was a corrupt um, leader at the time who found him guilty no matter what and insisted on uh, a disproportionate punishment, things like that. This is why the evolution of the Christian thinking has come to a point where uh, punishment has to be proportional. It has to be um, considered. And of course, even to the individual circumstances and the individual, the uniqueness of the individual, these are all part of our development, of our thinking. Now, to deconstruct those and to go back to might is right, if you like, clubs and axes, and this is how we're going to resolve our differences, it really is a, a regression um, from where we are to something that is not good at all. And I think it's it's demonstrated. You bring up these totalitarians of history, and especially the last century, the most probably the most violent century in the history of mankind, the most willingly destructive in the millions, in the millions, even to their own people in the millions, 
it's just it's hideous what's been going on and surely there's a profound lesson to learn from that and and if you like you've got to bring into account what was the compass what was the compass that actually guided us to form a better point of view and it was that the individual was sacred that the law or the purpose of law of customs of constitutions of all things was to serve the individual to provide that environment which was most suitable that each and every individual could be served not a majority so that you had a majority of 50% plus one dominated a minority of 50% minus one that's not that's not effective that's domination that's the if you like might is right perspective whereas it was that the purpose of government the purpose of institutions even a golf club you don't have it that the golf club dominates the majority over the minority but rather the golf club serves the well-being of the individual providing the right environment so that you are free to go and enjoy a game of golf whenever you want to as an individual i want to do it on friday mornings well if it's not as long as it's not ladies mornings well why not you can do it on Friday mornings, rain, hail or shine. Or I only want to do it sunny days. I want to do it rainy days. I want to deal with the buffeting of the wind and become a better golfer. It's there to serve. That's the purpose of these institutions. So when, when our Lord said the Sabbath, the system of law, was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, it meant that the totalitarian who imposed it, if you like the Pharisee, who imposed the system of law over the people, totalitarianism in that, in, in that instance was not the correct design. The purpose of law is to serve man, is to provide an environment where individuals are free to come and go as they choose. They are free to pursue their own medical choices. They're free to pursue their own careers, their own vocations, their own calling. These are all part of the evolution of the individual. Now, to turn around creative destruction on that means that we go back to the mob. We go back to the, if you like, the tribe. And it's a warring tribe. Whichever tribe is dominant and the rest are slaughtered. And that's what we've seen in this last century. The domination each time ends in slaughter. Is that really where we want to go? Or are we going to actually look back and find that compass? What brought us to where we are today? What brought us? We've got to go and find that compass. And in my view, that compass is, if you like, anchored in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Your thoughts, please, um, Robert Clink. Well, the uh, idea of the uh, revolutionaries today is to erase all sense of historical uh, memory. And there's a purpose behind this, and that is exactly to prevent people from looking for, the, for inspiration uh, where you have suggested it should be found, Arnie. Uh, they're uh, trying to prevent uh, religious services from being held. They're uh, destroying churches. I read the other day that on average in France, three churches are being set alight every day. This is, this is not accidental. This is a campaign against the Christian faith. And I, I've got to provoke a reaction at some point, but uh, it seems to be somewhat slow in coming. And it, the really distressing thing is that the uh, so-called civic authorities and so on are not intervening in any effective way to protect, to protect our heritage. And even uh, what you mentioned there about justice, the Christian concept of justice, which is to protect the individual against abuse and uh, uh, false reporting and that sort of thing. But nowadays, there are two kinds of justice. There's the justice that we used to assume was sort of written on the hearts of men, that you, if you presented a, a, a set of facts, then you could ascertain 
what was fair in resolving the outcome of a, of a legal situation. But now what's predominant is something called social justice. And this is just the old trick that Marxists have used over and over of destroying a good term by attaching an adjective to it that suggests that it is not something fundamental, but it's just sort of uh, an opinion, an alternative way of looking at things. If they talk about social justice, well, they can define that however they want. They're not appealing to something inside the individual, which gives them a guidance in dealing with their fellow man. So uh, this is a part of the reframing of vocabulary, which was so brilliantly analyzed in George Orwell's 1984. Everyone must read that book about the rewriting of the dictionary and the redefinition of all the terms and the erasing of uh, historical facts so that nobody would ever know those things had happened before. Well, the tearing down of statues is exactly the same as that. They're trying to erase all sense of our cultural past. And if they can do that, well, we're going in for very rough times. Because as you said, Arnie, they did that in uh, Russia, or in Russia, certainly, with the destruction of all the churches after the uh, Bolshevik Revolution. And in China, they had the Cultural Revolution. And well, we know the principle underlying the Cultural Revolution because uh, Mao expressed it very succinctly. He said, power comes out of the end of a gun. Well, do we want to live in a society where that is the underlying assumption? That's <laughs> not a very pleasant prospect. So it will be absolutely might makes right and the possessors of the guns are going to be making the decisions for everybody else the, the smallest decisions of their lives and uh, surveilling them and telling them what they can and cannot do. It's a, it's a vision of hell, really. So uh, one hopes that people will get some kind of a grasp of the thinking of the people who are promoting all this stuff. And that thinking is uh, uh, dialectical materialism. It's Marxist dialectics. It's very important that people should educate themselves on this so they can understand what is uh, motivating these people to go out and run riot and sort of act like uh, lunatics. Well, mm. it, it's, they, it's not lunacy in their perspective. It is the uh, destru creative destruction that will allow the creation of a brave new world, mm. and uh, uh, that's that, that's what we're witnessing in Western countries everywhere. Yeah, thank you for that, Robert. I might add to that that okay, you, you mentioned the people on the streets and the demonstration, Black Lives Matter or whatever, but in actual fact, there's design, and of course, design and coordination higher up, and uh, we've got to consider that that this is not coming from a spontaneous. Um, if you like, from the floor of people who are frustrated out of predicament, but they're actually part of the shock troops for a bigger picture. And that bigger picture, of course, you see coming out of, if you like, organisations like the World Economic Forum, um, which is really an outworking of capital and communism together. It's where they align, where they actually, the nexus, they come together in order to plan strategy. And, and of course, because it's in a dialectical fashion, it's hard to conceive. How do we see these opposites? And yet the, the policy is the same. The policy of one is one of power. We're at the 34-minute um, mark, um, so we're going well. Your thoughts, please, uh, Wallace Clink. Well, that's right, Ernie. It's, um, it's a diabolical skill in the use of the language wherein you're able to confuse your listeners because you're presenting things which are essentially contradictory. And the human mind, in its natural course of function, attempts to integrate things in a manner that 
brings things together in a constructive and a fruitful manner. But if you've got nihilism, mental, mental anarchy, uh, you simply cannot organize your thoughts in a manner which is going to bring about the fruition of constructive achievements. And that's exactly what is done today because language has been perverted. Uh, and that's one of the problems too, in that language has been used to the infiltration of Christianity itself. And Christianity has been perverted in some of its objectives in a way that makes it um, vulnerable to all sorts of uh, weaknesses and uh, false policies like full employment and things of that nature, um, especially that, because that's the core of fascism and communism. It's the core of any tyranny because a tyranny is the mobilization, the forced mobilization of human action and energy. So, um, so that language is a tremendously powerful thing because it shapes the attitudes of mankind. If you think about it, if you have some attitude towards something, did you not acquire that by exposure to some kind of verbal expression? I mean, if you go back and look for the, the origin of your thoughts, you've, you've come by them through language, because language is the way which we would transmit our concepts, our ideas. So he who controls uh, ideas controls the world, basically. And you have that, what has happened in the uh, tremendous, the absolutely outrageous centralization of ownership, control, and policy in the, in the world, in the realm of ideas, through the uh, media and through the educational system. We have been misled, and this has changed, perverted, twisted our views toward each other, toward our origins, toward what is right and wrong. And um, it's, it's, it's made us vulnerable to attack. And of course, the Christian idea is being assaulted as the source, source of our problems, when in fact, the source of our problems is not Christianity, it's a, it's, a, it's a perverted Christianity that has been distorted by those who have infiltrated it and who have corrupted it. And then you get bad results, and these same people come along and say, you see what a destructive and damaging and inadequate philosophy and policy it is. So you see, they work from within and they work from without. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really leaves you in a very, very vulnerable position unless you have been inclined to really look into things, to study things, to look for truth, to seek the kingdom, one way of putting it. And um, in that way, you're defenseless. And then they come along with some very destructive ideas, damaging ideas, inhuman ideas and present them as an alternative to what we have, saying that what we have is not what it is really alleged to be. So, and that's why Christians have been badly led astray. They do not understand the practical nature of their philosophy. Their... You see, I think, um, and so they have been actually led to pursue policies which are consonant with their enemies. And then we wonder why we have trouble. And somehow we have to, there are certain seals that to, they speak of as needing to be broken. Well, I'm not sure exactly where we stand in that, but I think it, it involves the exposure as truth, of truth as an alternative to falsehood. 
And uh, that is what we have to do. We have to somehow or another seek and find the kingdom in terms of truth, reality, and try to help others to do the same when we feel we've made some progress that way. And I think that is the only way. And I do think, Arnie, also, you were mentioning the way people are running around from pillar to post trying to solve solutions to our problems in this world. And I think they're trying to solve these things by the power of their intellect, whereas they should be trying to solve them in the first instance by establishing a com community or a, with whatever power it is that rules the universe. In other words, not to look to our own mortal reason as a solution to everything. We should reason. But if we don't reason in the right spirit, then our reason allows us actually to dig ourselves deeper and deeper into a well of ignorance uh, and iniquity. Because reason is a power to put things together. And if you put the wrong things together in the wrong way, because you're not motivated by the spirit. And the spirit is something that is beyond moral reason. I think it's something that is, I don't know if the word just intuitive is correct. It's something that you naturally do if you're in tune with whatever is the motivating force of this, of life. Yeah. yeah and I think we should start looking for a different and a higher motivation if we expect to solve our problems. Yeah. Thank you for that, Wally. That's beautifully put. I, um, you brought several things to mind. The first is that the um, an observation of natural law, um, you, you, you're putting things down to the spirit, and I understand that, and I respect that. But I also see that it's very important to see the, the outworking of things, how they actually, um, when the rubber hits the road, the effect of them. Now, we look at, say, Maoism, we look at Bolshevism, whatever, Pol Pot, the effect of the rubber when it hit the road. We saw that. We saw the carnage of Nazism. We saw the carnage. That is the end result. So conceiving something in your mind is only half of the equation. And it's a very small half at that. What you've got to do is you've got to place it into context. You've got to actually embody it. And with that word embody, I want to actually just make reference to a particular fellow on our website in our uh, PDF library. And I'm pretty sure I've got a, a couple of his uh, articles there. And that is Ian McGilchrist. Uh, McGilchrist there, can the divided brain tell us anything? Divided brain, divided world, etc., etc. Now, McGilchrist, he actually mapped, um, with the help of others, he actually mapped the um, the methods of thinking, if you like, the methods of processing thought in our mind. Um, and he mapped it using exploring the difficulties that stroke patients have, hundreds and hundreds of them. And these stroke patients were analysed as to the area of damage and how they actually processed thought. And the two hemispheres process thinking differently. The left hemisphere, if you like, is an abstraction and only deals with numbers or facts, whereas the right hemisphere places things into context. It looks at the real world and how, how the, if you like, the abstraction is embodied, how it actually works, how it actually works. So the church used to teach us at one stage about natural law how their things actually work, how, if you like, you look at a, say, I looked at some sheepdogs the other day, beautiful creatures they were, and then their nature, what it is instinctive to herd sheep, to actually be around and running around, and it is different. You get a Pomeranian, you get a sheepdog, you get a, you get a Doberman. They are different characteristics to each, and so it is, even one litter, the group of dogs coming from one litter is different. 
We are unique creatures and we've got to take into account that uniqueness. When we deal with our neighbour, all neighbours are not the same. Each neighbour is different. And each, if you like, husband and wife, each family is different. How they choose to bring up their children. You can't just do a one size fits all. So under the, if you like, the philosophy of equality, there is no quality at all. No quality at all. Now, when you go to, when you go to pick an apple off a tree, if there's no quality at all, then you can have all the rotten ones. Absolutely. You can have them. And you can have as many as you like. You can come to my tree and you don't believe in it. You can have all the rotten ones. But I will be selective and I'll choose the particular fruit I choose. And what's left I'll give to the chooks. It's not wasted. It's just converted into other forms. And you shall know them by their... By their fruits. That's right. By their fruits. And so it is the same with the individual. When we're actually doing things, the outworking of those things, the fruits of what we do. So it is with government, so it is with policy, so it is with principle. Culture is the same as well. There are good fruits. You shall know them by their fruits. The I was reading the other day, and I'll, I'll sort of pull up stumps on this because we're at 46 minutes, but I was reading the other day of Captain James Cook, and his, uh, if you like, his circumnavigation, um, his travels as he was heading into the Pacific and where he actually um, circumnavigated New Zealand, the North Island, before he headed across to um, find the new Great South Land. There was a Frenchman, I, with due respect, and I apologise for not knowing his name, but he was actually outside of Sydney Heads, but he didn't know it. He was outside of Sydney Heads 50 days before Cook, 50 days. Australia could have been colonised by the French, but it wasn't. Because between those two people, there was a difference. And it's interesting that that French captain went on to cross the Pacific and across there, and he ended up in really bad shape. His whole crew was in really bad shape as he approached the South American coast. And it's so desperate, he dressed in his entire regalia uh, into one of the boats to go ashore um, in order to present himself as an authority to approach the, um, the colony that was there. And the boat capsized, and he drowned. And yet Cook went on to map the east coast of Australia and to change, if you like, history, that individual history. And it's a most interesting book that um, um, the, I uh, can't remember his name, the professor who wrote the book, but it was beautiful in commemoration of 250 years since Cook circumnavigated New Zealand and mapped the east coast of Australia. And of course, then went on for Australia to become a colony of the British Empire. So that part of history made the difference, that unique individual. He was not equal with anyone. He was not, and neither are you, and neither should we accept it that our culture is somehow or other equal with other cultures. It is not. It has gone ahead, and it has given us institutions. It has given us trial by jury, not by combat. Is America right to go and bomb these people from Serbia? Is it right to do those only 20 years ago? Was it right? That is might is right. And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at that as a principle that this is so, so wrong. They have no right to do it. But we're seeing it demonstrated. And if, we, if this is the world that we want to live in and accept mediocrity, accept equality, well then that's, that's unfortunately is going to be a living hell, as you said. It, it really is. Your um, 49 minute mark, I'd, it's, a, it's been an interesting day. I'm sorry that we really haven't done um, sufficient closing comments and thoughts, but I will give you just a couple of minutes each, please, uh, Robert Clink. Well, as opposed to the uh, creative destruction and the order out of chaos idea that uh, is being promoted today, the Christian concept was one of an unfolding of the universe. And it was something to which, in which we participated and which we could uh, study and observe and learn from to uh, benefit from uh, furthering our knowledge about it. So it's a, it's a totally different concept of all this conflict and 
uh, identity politics and, you know, even going back to the Big Bang, the people who insist that the universe created uh, was created by some gigantic, horrible event of <laughs> violence, violence. Everything is violence in, uh, in the uh, uh, academic world, it seems. So Christianity has a totally different mindset, and that is a mindset of harmony, and it's also a mindset of an abundant universe. And the only reason people advocate equality, which doesn't exist anywhere in the universe as far as I can see, I'd like to see anything in the universe that is actually equal to anything else, even if it's, a, if it's of the same type or something, it's not equal. And the only reason that people advocate equality is that they are being denied access to the abundance of the universe. It's crowding in around us all the time, but the particularly the financial powers have interposed themselves between that abundance and the people for whom it was intended by the creator. Beautiful, beautiful. And that is an abundant God. Yes, the lilies of the field. Your thoughts and closing comments, please, Wallace Clank. Yes, uh, Ernie, I think that that is very well stated. Um, I think that there is a law, well, Eric Butler referred to it in his book, the law of the love. Hmm. That is a thing that is goes beyond anything we know in a temporal sense. It is something that inheres within the universe. And I think that it is the only law that we can trust. Any human laws, they may work in a sense to guide us, but they are always subject to human uh, weakness, uh, fo foibles. And I think that when we speak of law, we should not confine our idea of law to some kind of rules that men make. What is it that makes you in awe when you look into the face of a little child? What was it that fascinated you when you looked at these uh, sheep that you were speaking of? Mm -hmm. uh, what is it that has this fascination and a, an attraction that goes beyond anything you can reduce to reason in terms of words? It is something that is, it's something in your nature. And unless we can get back to that, and that, so that our reason is guided primarily in our practical affairs by reference to that love, to that universal, all prevailing love, then we are not in harmony with the universe. And so we are not gonna succeed if we just run around trying to find solutions of our own on this little globe upon which we live. Thank you for that, Wally. That's beautifully put. I'm just going to do a short advert for um, for those viewers who are not aware of some of the services that we do. Um, the Australian League of Rights website, ALOR.org, you'll find the On Target. On Target is a weekly journal produced. It disseminates the news. It actually goes into what is actually unfolding politically in Australia and around the world. It's very, very important. We've also got the, um, the New Times Survey, which is a monthly journal looking at particular debt finance and the correct relationship to the individual. And of course, as the front page shows, we do the videos, the broadcast held on our Crossroads website and the podcasts, which we do on in a couple of days time, that's held on our Freedom Potentials website. So um, thank you so much, gentlemen, for today. I really, really appreciated your time and the discussion on creative destruction and analysis from a Christian perspective. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Cheers. Thank you, Ernie. It's wonderful to reflect on these things.